All right, we'll um, resume the class. So before the break, we were looking at the second question which Habakkuk asks. So Habakkuk's question is, Lord, why are you using something evil like the Babylonians to fulfill your holy purposes? And this is God's reply. God says, what I'm going to talk to you is, what I'm going to reply to you is so important that I want you to actually put it down in writing. I want you to send out this message to everyone so that everyone will get to read what I am saying. And what I am saying will happen in the end and it will not prove false. It may look like as if it is lingering and getting delayed, but wait for it because there is actually not going to be any delay in what I'm going to do. I will do it exactly at the time when I have planned to do it. So God says these things to Habakkuk and then he says, it is true that the enemy is puffed up. You know, his desires are not right. So it is true that the enemy is always going to continue working against you. But the righteous person does not need to worry because the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. So over here, it's talking about two aspects of faith of the righteous person. He is faithful in the sense he will continue to trust in God no matter what. And he is also faithful in the sense he chooses to obey the Lord. So there are two aspects which are talked about over here when it talks about the righteous person's faith. It's talking about the trust which he has in God. Even though everything looks negative, the person chooses to continue trusting in God, in the goodness of God, and that God will help, and that God will deliver. The person stops, uh, you know, the, the, the person never stops trusting in God. So that aspect of faith is being talked about over here. But it's also talking about the other aspect of faith, which is obedience. So not only does this person continue to trust in God, he continues to obey God and stay faithful to God. So by doing these two things, placing his faith in God completely, by obeying the Lord as, you know, as well as he can on a daily basis, through obedience and through trust, this person is able to live. So the assurance that God gives is what I'm promising uh, the justice which I am promising will happen in the time which I have appointed for it. But in the meantime, the righteous person will be protected because he will live by his faith. Now, this is an important verse for the New Testament believers because like the people in the time of Habakkuk, we too are living in highly exploitative times where the rich think that they can do whatever they want. Those who are powerful think that they can crush the church. Those who are, uh, you know, have influence, they think they can uh, do evil things to Christians and escape because they, Christians, uh, they think are helpless and will not be able to retaliate. So we are living in difficult times. And this word, these words which God speaks apply to us. He says, the things which I'm saying, the things which I'm promising, it speaks of the end. And when those end times come, it will not be proved false. What I'm promising, I will do for you people. And he says, though it linger, though it looks like as if it's not going, it's not happening, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Now, Jesus uses this, the same idea when he is talking in the New Testament. Uh, this is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, you know, where he gives the parable uh, of a widow who goes to an unjust judge for justice. And the unjust judge in the beginning just ignores her. But when she goes on continuously asking for justice, he finally gets fed up and he says, okay, fine, you know, you can have your justice. And Jesus says, when that man who doesn't even care about justice finally gave it to her, don't you think a loving God who cares about his people, will he not give justice to his people as quickly as possible? And these are the words which God speaks over there. Uh, so if, if someone could read out for us Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. Luke 18, 
verses 7 and 8. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will you find faith on earth? So Jesus says, when the right time comes, God will do what is required for his people. He will be faithful. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will there be any righteous people left who are living by faith? Or will everyone give up and say, oh, God just made a lot of long promises and he didn't bother fulfilling them. And will people just turn away and give up? Or in the end times, will there still be some people left who are actually still living by faith? So when that son of man comes or the second coming, is he going to find such people? And so in these verses, Jesus is basically encouraging the believers. He's encouraging his disciples and he's telling them and saying, Sometimes it looks like as if the justice is getting delayed. But, you know, remember what it says in Habakkuk. God says, even though it looks like as if it is lingering, wait. Because, uh, you know, he says, it will certainly come and will not delay. In God's appointment, appointed time, what he has promised will take place. Um, it's very difficult for me to remember what example I used in which class. So if I'm repeating this, please bear with me. Uh, uh, you know, I think I might have mentioned this about um, uh, this relative of mine, a widow, and uh, she was trying, you know, somebody was trying to take away her um, flat from her. He wanted um, her to sell it to him at a cheap rate, and he was refusing to vacate from that house. Uh, and uh, she was helpless. She didn't know what to do. So uh, I claimed Luke chapter 18. I said, Lord, this is, a, this is an actual you know, ca case which is so similar to what you said in Luke 18. And so I began to pray Luke 18 over her. And I said, Lord, you know, grant her justice. Uh, this man, he's, uh, he's a lawyer. He's in a powerful position. You know, he's not vacating the flat. And he's saying, give it to me at a cheap rate. And he's trying to take it from her because she know he knows that she's helpless. She can't make him you know, leave. Uh, she can't hire gundas and force him out of the house. And plus, he's a lawyer. He know he he knows what to do and what to say. So I I really believe that the Lord would do a mighty miracle and drive that man out of that flat, and she would be able to get her flat. I really thought that that would happen. Uh, but then after about six months of praying, uh, you know, circumstances came to a stage where she had no choice and she had to sell. Uh, the flat to him at a bad rate. And I said, Lord, you promised in Luke chapter 18 that you will answer, you will give justice. And what is this, Lord? Why has this not happened? You know, and then it took me a few years to realize that, you know, God um, compensated for the injustice which was done in other ways. You know, uh, even up to today, uh, even though now she's very, very old, she is greatly blessed in so many ways. God's hand of blessing is upon her. Yes, he allowed that one act of injustice to take place, but he has taken care of her in so many ways and made up for what she has lost. You know, So God does not always act in the way we would like him to act. But when he says, I am a God of justice, he means it. What he has promised, you know, he will fulfill in the lives of his righteous ones. So we can trust that. And so Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will there be people who are still willing to trust and obey and hold on, even though negative things have happened? Or will you be like the shallow people who give up and say, ah, oh, why should we trust God? So... What Jesus is urging and saying is, you know, do not give up. In fact, it says in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That's the reason why he even told that parable to them, so that they will never give up. They will be people who will remain, you know, righteous and continue to live by faith. Such people... God will uphold. 
and that is why this one little verse you know which is mentioned in habakkuk chapter 2 verse um, 4 it is mentioned three times that same verse is mentioned three times in the new testament in romans i can't remember the exact references in romans and then in galatians and uh, then in hebrews in romans the emphasis is on what kind of righteousness in galatians the emphasis is on uh, how will these righteous people live what will god do for them and then in um, in hebrews it talks about what kind of a faith these righteous people should have so this verse is so important that three times in the new testament you know um, uh, paul tries to elaborate on what this verse means and how it applies to us believers today in our context. So this is something that we should take seriously. Even though we feel that injustice is being done to us, even though sometimes we feel as if God is neglecting us, the righteous, how do they actually overcome? How do they gain victory? It is by living by faith, by continuing to trust the Lord, continuing to obey and holding on to him. That is how we manage to have victory. And when the time of judgment comes, God says, nothing will be able to stop it. It will take place without delay. Okay, so we have to place these things in the Lord's hands. And after God speaks these words to Habakkuk, he gives five, you know, judgments, which he speaks against the proud nations, including Babylon. So he says in... Um, in chapter 2 verse 8 he says you know those who are plundering other people they will also be plundered one day and then he says those who are building up their dynasties their dynasties will be put to shame one day and then he says you know they're building up their their kingdom like as if it's a beautiful house but the lord of the armies will crush that house uh, the fourth thing that he says they think that they are achieving a lot of glory but i will put them to shame is what he says and then the fifth thing he says they are trusting in their idols but their idols will let them down they the idols will not be able to help them get what they want so god speaks these five words of judgment against the proud nations against babylon and then habakkuk makes his prayer of submission and he says yes lord i'm just leaving this matter in your hands that you have tried to explain to me why you are using something evil to bring about good you have explained that yes you are you're using an evil instrument like the babylonians to bring about justice but you have also explained that one day when the time comes even babylon also will be judged that too will fall so yes even though you are using an impure instrument when the time comes that impure instrument will also be punished so habakkuk says you know these things best so, O oh Lord, I trust you. I leave it in your hands. Why? Because the righteous live by faith. I'll just continue to trust you and I'll continue to obey you. That's basically what he you know, uh, says in the entire chapter 3. So, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, you know, he makes a request and he says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. So he says, I've heard about all the things which you did in our national history, Lord. You know, all the great miracles which you did, the great judgments which you brought upon our enemies. I've heard about all those things. And what you're saying about the future, you know, when what you will do in the end, I believe that also. But Lord, in our time, also please do something show mercy to us who are living right now you know those are the words which he speaks in habakkuk 3 verse 2 he says repeat them in our day in our time make them known you know the same things which you did in the past to other people if you could do that in our time even for us oh lord and this is a prayer which i you know pray a lot i say lord i've heard all the bible stories the great and mighty things which you did in those days in my time, O oh Lord, in my day, even as you know, we are struggling, Lord, if you can repeat those things. You know, since so we can pray these prayers, um, uh, these verses which are there in the Bible, we can pray them to the Lord. 
And so after having made this humble prayer, in the next few verses, verse 3 up to verse 15, he reminds himself of how great God is, how powerful he is, how when he when, when the Lord comes, the mountains, you know, they quake. Uh, you know, he, he talks about all the greatness of God in poetic language. And then in verse 16, he says, Lord, you have made a promise. So I'll patiently wait, O Lord, for your judgment to come. When the time comes, I know you will do it. So in the meantime, I will patiently wait for you. You know, so he submits himself. He expresses it, his trust. And in verse 16, he says, until you do what you have promised, I will wait trustingly. I will not give up hoping. I will continue to hope and I will wait. And therefore, he makes this declaration. And this is very famous, these verses, this last few verses. So if we could have someone read out Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17, 18, 19. Habakkuk chapter 3. This is 17, 18, and 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flocks be cut off from the fold, and there be no hurt in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength, He makes my feet like that there's. He makes me trade on my high places. So here, you know, he says, Lord, I'm just submitting everything into your hands. I will wait patiently for what you have promised you will do. And in the meantime, if everything goes to complete destruction, no problem. I'll continue to trust in you and you will help me to survive. You know, that's basically how, you know, you could translate it into modern day language. So basically he's saying, if the fig tree does not bud anymore, the, the wine uh, the wine creepers stop giving grapes. The olive crop, it grows, but then something bad happens and the entire crop fails. And the fields are not producing any more food. And all the sheep which are there in the you know sheep fold, um, they all get emptied out. All the sheep die. No cattle are left. You know, in those days, this basically was the wealth of the people. They didn't really think in terms of gold and silver. They had some gold and silver, but mainly what was the wealth of a household? It was the cattle which they had, the crops which they grew. So basically he's saying, in the meantime, if, you know, while I'm waiting for your answer to come, even if all my crops go off, even if all my cattle get killed, if, if my entire sheep uh, you know, pen is empty, even if all those things happen, what is going to be my attitude was... No, I know, um, 18, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Why? Because God said the righteous will live by faith. As long as I continue to trust in you and obey you, you will take care of me. In fact, what will you do for me? He says in the next verse, you, O Lord, will be my strength and you will make my feet like the feet of a deer. Now, to understand this, you know, it's uh, we would actually have to go into our uh, um, YouTube and look at all those, you know, National Geographic clippings and all of that. Uh, I remember one clipping where there's some wild animal following the deer. Don't remember whether it was a wolf or whether it was a leopard or something. Something was following this deer. It was a young, you know, not fully grown. And it was running, 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 and this wild animal is chasing it. And then they came to this mountainous, um, you know, it's like a slope, a mountainous slope. And in a matter of, uh, you know, minutes, this, this deer is still very young. It's not even a fully grown deer. It just went up that, uh, that mountain slope, you know, like, uh, like as if it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's an experienced mountain climber without even waiting. And then this other animal, the carnivorous animal, it could not follow. It's just waiting down below, staring up. Because the deer's feet have been created in such a way that even if the mountain slope has just got small footholds, it's able to balance in the, you know, it's able to put its feet in those footholds and maintain its balance and not come crashing down. The bigger animal didn't have the guts to go up. It just stayed down below. You know, and I, I mean, I actually literally saw this on, a, on one of the YouTube clippings. So he's saying, Lord, maybe my entire crop will go. 
No, I mean, he's using poetic language over here because basically his concern is about the Babylonian invasion. But, you know, he's, he's basically saying, even if everything gets emptied out, Lord, I will continue to rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Why? Because the sovereign Lord, he is my strength. He will make my feet like the feet of a deer and I will be able to tread on the heights where the enemy will not be able to destroy me. I will survive. God will help me. I will come through the situation that I and my family are facing. These are the words of, of uh, faith which, with which he ends his um, book. So the book of Habakkuk is basically telling us God sometimes uses very, very unusual methods. God sometimes, um, you know, uh, has a timetable where it looks like as if he's delaying and not giving us what we require. But in the middle of all of this, our attitude should be the righteous shall live by faith. So later when you have time, you know, if you just simply type out the word righteous shall live by faith Bible verses in Google, it will show you all the three references, the one in Romans, the one in Galatians, the one in Hebrews. Look at those verses. Look at what it says about how a believer should live. You know, what kind of righteousness, what kind of a life that righteous person is promised, and what kind of a faith that righteous person should have. The three aspects of that verse are described in these three passages. And allow God to talk to you and say, you know, uh, how you are meant to live. Allow God to build up your hope. You know, even as you meditate on those scriptures. So Habakkuk is, is grateful for the answer which the Lord has provided. And he says, Lord, even though things get really bad, I will rejoice in you because you have made a promise. And I know when the time comes, you will make my feet like the feet of that deer. You know, I'll be able to climb a mountain slope. The enemy will not be able to follow me over through. And I will be able to stand on the heights. I will be protected. I will be taken care of. Um, it just kind of usually reminds me this this particular passage. It reminds me of a testimony that I had heard. Uh, we had a German, uh, you know, very old person in his uh, 80s, an old uh, German teacher who had come once to you know teach us some particular subject. Can't remember which, but he gave his testimony. He talked about how they, I think it was an Australian. They had this orange. Uh, orchards and his entire crop got destroyed one particular you know year and then the next season again there was some kind of a um, some kind of disease among the trees or something and then again two years in a row you know he lost all his crop and he was in a very bad condition and then there was a fire inside his house so a portion of the house also burned down and he says that that time he and his wife they, you know, they stood on these verses and they said, even though the entire crop gets destroyed, I will rejoice in the Lord. And he talked about how the Lord, you know, slowly after that, you know, blessed them, built up their lives once again, and they were able to stand on their feet once again. And he talked about the great faithfulness of God in their lives. Uh, so I'll always remember, you know, I always remember that story whenever I read this uh, passage. So Habakkuk is giving us the assurance that our God is a God who can be uh, trusted. Now, um, just another one detail, you know, before we leave this book of Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk, as I told you, was written during the time of Josiah, the good king. Josiah makes one mistake, which actually, uh, you know, allows the Babylonians to become more powerful. And that is basically described for us in Second Chronicles chapter 35. Um, so what, uh, you know, just to summarize, because we don't have time. Um, the, if you remember, after Nineveh, you know, um, God promised that he will destroy the city of Nineveh. And so after the destruction of uh, Nineveh takes place in 612 BC, the few Assyrian people who are still left they go to a place named Haran and they try to restart their empire over there. And then uh, the Babylonians crush them uh, in that place. So from Haran, they move to an another place called Karshemish, which is in Egypt. And they try to again restore themselves in that place. 
So at that time, there's some kind of partnership formed between these leftover Assyrians and the um, uh, Egyptian emperor. So when the uh, Babylonians are making planning an attack on these leftover Assyrians, at that time, um, the Egyptian pharaoh Neko, he decides to come to the rescue of these leftover Assyrians and help them fight against the Babylonians. For him to do that, he has to travel through land which now belongs to Josiah. Josiah has reclaimed many of the lost cities, you know, which has uh, during the time of Hezekiah, uh, the Assyrians had taken over those cities. But Josiah is able to redeem all of those cities, win them back. And so now that entire Philistine territory is now under Josiah's control. And this Egyptian pharaoh, Neko, has to cross with his army through this territory, which belongs to Josiah, to go and help the leftover Assyrians, you know, so that they can fight against the Babylonians and crush them. And at that time, Josiah says, how dare you try to come through my territory? And this is what um, uh, the Pharaoh Neko says to um, Josiah in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verses 20 to 24. He says, God himself has given me permission to go and attack these Babylonians. So why are you getting in the way? Why are you trying to stop me? Josiah does not listen. And Josiah, I think, does not bother to consult with God whether he should be doing this battle or not. But actually, he goes and fights against Neko. What he does is uh, he gets wounded in the battle. And in fact, he dies from his battle wounds. But what happens is he manages to weaken the forces of the Egyptians. The Pharaoh Neko's army is crushed to a great extent. If they had stayed powerful, they could have really made a big attack on the Babylonians and, you know, um, delayed their power for many, many years. But by not following God's instructions, by not inquiring from God, what Josiah actually does is he ends up weakening the Egyptians who were actually in a position of strength and they could have done something to control the Babylonians. But because he does not listen to the word of the Lord, nor does he consult the Lord, the Egyptians are weakened in this battle which Josiah has with the Egyptians and they lose their position of power. So a few years later when, um, when, the, uh, when the Babylonians come and attack, the Egyptians are not in a, any position to you know, uh, do anything. So in a way, the, uh, the people of Judah, in their foolishness, help the Babylonians in becoming stronger. So what God promised, you know, in Habakkuk 1.6, he says to Habakkuk, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. You know, God says, I will help raise them up. That actually happens because of the um, actions of Josiah. That's just one brief uh, point that I wanted to touch upon. Uh, so let's move into the book of Zephaniah. Now, Zephaniah, uh, yes, go ahead. Mm. Loudly. Those three verses, the righteous shall, righteous shall live by faith. Mm. I got those three. Uh, you can read them out because I don't remember the references. Tell. It's I mean, just, just give the references so that people can write them down. It's Roman 117. Okay, Romans 117. Hebrew 1038. Hebrew 1038. And Galat Galatians 311. Galatians 311. Yes. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for those references. Okay, book of Zephaniah. Now, Zephaniah was not just a priest, not just a prophet. He was part of the royal family. He was one of the descendants of Hezekiah. So he was somebody important. Um, I mean, at least politically, he was important. Uh, so Zephaniah, uh, he also gives his prophecies around the same time as all these other people. Nahum, Jeremiah, uh, Habakkuk, all these people belong to the same time period, you know, during the end of the reign of uh, the Judahite kingdom. So Zephaniah is basically giving his prophecies at um, uh, during the time of Josiah, and um, this is the condition, you know, before Josiah comes to the throne. 
as long as hezekiah was there on the throne hezekiah was a very very godly king after that you have manasseh his son coming to the throne manasseh you know the bible says in chronicles was one of the most evil kings maybe maybe ahab was worse but apart from ahab uh you know uh, in the northern kingdom here in the southern kingdom uh, manasse is one of the worst you know one of the most terrible uh, kings so he is the one it says uh, who used to sacrifice his children to the um to the to some pagan god uh molek yeah he used to sacrifice his children to the um, to the god of fire of the ammonites called molek so um manase and then afterwards his son amon they bring in a lot of very um, very evil idol worship under them uh, temple prostitution becomes very very widely prevalent under them human sacrifices increase under them a lot of evil comes inside the nation which was not there to such an extent earlier so it is basically under manase and amon that things become very very bad yes it is true that in uh, second chronicles chapter 32 we learn about how manase repents you know in his um, old age he repents of his sinfulness uh, but basically a lot of evil happens during the time of these people so when josiah comes to the throne spiritually the kingdom is in a very very bad condition um especially because of the worship of two idol three idols baal you know which was basically worshiped because it's supposed to make your you know crops grow well uh, they worshiped molek um, and they also worshiped uh, a female uh, idol uh, named uh, ashtart ashtart okay so these are the, these three were the three main popular idols at that time now this molek was basically a large metal statue uh, a metal idol uh, so what they would basically do in those days is that they would construct this large metal idol uh, called molek and it would have a hole in the middle of its stomach uh, because they would burn a fire inside that inside that hole inside the stomach and it would have two outstretched arms you know uh, like as if it's holding out its arms in front of it and um, so what they would do these uh, people who are worshipers of molek they would bring their first born child and they would you know place it in the arms of this metal idol so the baby would slide you know down the arms into the hole where you have the burning fire and the child is literally burnt to death i mean they do that to a newborn baby such a evil horrible thing to do and why were they doing it because they believed that if they sacrifice their first born to molek then molek will give them many many more children and he will also bring them financial prosperity so this is something which manase made very popular in the land and after that you know people began to practice it everywhere in the same way there was this other idol uh, ashtarth a female idol uh, which involved a lot of immorality and prostitution so all of these evil practices had been brought into the nation and like we saw josiah takes a stand against it he makes a conscious effort to bring about a spiritual revival so that all these evil practices are completely you know destroyed so he 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 goes from place to place destroying all those temples all the places where they have set up these statues you know where they have constructed these uh, large temple complexes where prostitution is taking place he destroys all of that and there's a great revival during his time and uh, so zephaniah is giving his prophecies during this time period Uh, if you look at the structure of the book of zephaniah uh, in chapter 1 up to chapter 3 verse 10 is basically where he talk, gives different ju judgments of god and then the last portion of chapter 3 he talks about one day the future day of the lord when restoration will once again be brought so uh, 
the first few uh, first two chapters and the third chapter up to verse 10 he gives judgments against judah judgment against the surrounding nations a judgment against nineveh he talks about all of those places and then in the last portion chapter 3 verses 11 to 20 he talks about the future day of the lord okay um this is going to be the day of the Lord when God will restore Israel, when there will be peace established among the nations and all of that. Um, this is what we learn in uh, Josiah's, um, this is what we learn in Zephaniah's prophecies. He talks about some good things which God will do for his people when he judges the other nations. Um, we can maybe look at these particular verses. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 4 where four particular cities are mentioned. Okay, Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 4 if someone could read out. Yeah, maybe someone online because here the students have gone to sleep. Anyone is willing to read Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 4? For Gaza shall be forsaken, and uh, Askelon desolate, they shall drive out as though at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Okay, so in this particular verse, uh, God is speaking a judgment against the Philistines. And this is what God says he will do for his people. He says Gaza will be completely abandoned. You know, these are all these these four are Philistine cities. So God says Gaza will be completely abandoned. Ashkelon will be completely ruined. He says that Ashdod, you know, or the enemy will drive everybody out and it will be emptied. And he says Ekron will be uprooted. Now we actually have archaeological proof about what happened to two of these places. Um, we get to know from a written record which has been discovered, you know, one of those um, clay tablets on which they used to write things. Uh, so they have, uh, you know, archaeologists have discovered that. And from that, we get to know uh, that Ashdod was controlled by a Judahite governor during the time of Josiah. You know, it says literally, it says there on that clay tablet, this place, uh, Ashdod, is now under the control of the governor of Judah, under the king Josiah, which means God helped him to conquer this place. In the same way, we also have some historical proof regarding Ekron. Now, um, during the time of Hezekiah, when these cities were taken over by the Assyrian people, um, they made many of the Israelite people slaves and they put them in this place, Ekron, to work as slaves in the olive oil fields over there. So for a few generations, a lot of Israelites were living as slave, slave laborers in Ekron, you know, where they had to work in the olive oil fields. So during the time of Josiah, he is able to set them free. You know, he's able to take back Ekron from the Assyrians. Uh, and he's able to, uh, you know, uh, establish uh, the, you know, he's able to redeem all the slaves who have been uh, kept captured over there. So, because of Josiah's faithfulness, you know, Zephaniah prophesies and says that God will help you, uh, you know, in having success over some of these enemy nations. And some of those prophecies are fulfilled right then and there in the time of Josiah himself. So Josiah himself is able to conquer back some of these places. So we see that promise of God being fulfilled in the time of uh, Josiah. So these are all not just random prophecies which were given by a God, you know, who did not know how to make things happen. But we even have archaeological and historical proof of how some of these prophecies were fulfilled in history. Um, Another thing that maybe we can see regarding the day of the Lord, which Zephaniah talks about in the last portion of his uh, writing. Um, this is what Zephaniah says in the beginning of his book. Uh, maybe we can read out that first. Uh, Zephaniah 1 verses 2 and 3. 
where he talks about the upcoming destruction. And then in the last chapter, he talks about the restoration. So Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, if someone can read out first. Yeah. I'll, I will utterly consume everything for the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the words of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the whipped. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. Here in the beginning of the book of Zephaniah, God talks about a universal judgment which he is going to bring in the very end time. When not only the people who are left will be attacked, even it says the birds and the fish and the animals also will be wiped out. Now, why would God want to destroy his own creation? It's one thing to think that God will destroy the evil humans who have been unrighteous. But why would God destroy the birds and the fish and the you know beasts? You know, why would God do that? And that is because when sin came into the world, not only were humans corrupted, it says that all creation was corrupted. So the general uh, belief that people have is that maybe when God first created the animals and the birds, the animals never killed each other. All animals lived at peace with one another as vegetarian, you know, as herbivorous creatures. There were no carnivorous creatures. So the general belief is that after the sin came into the world and the fall happened, from that time onwards, the herbivorous animals started to turn into, change into carnivorous animals and birds. So earlier, uh, you know, maybe all, uh, all creation lived at peace with, you know, one another. And so uh, in the last portion of Zephaniah, where he talks about the day of the Lord, you know, in the last portion, verses uh, 11 to 20, um, maybe we can just read out one verse, uh, you know, chapter 3, verse 20. Yeah, if someone could read out. Zephaniah 3, 20. At that time I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth, when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. So in that time of peace which God will establish, where uh, it's basically talking about the Zephaniah, last portion of Zephaniah chapter 3 is talking about the millennium kingdom, when Jesus Christ will come down and establish his throne on the earth for a millennia, for a thousand years. He will rule. At that time, um, the animals also will live at peace with one another. We don't see that mentioned here in Zephaniah, but then you know we have that mentioned in Isaiah, where it talks about how um, even the animals and birds will be living at peace. So in Zephaniah first chapter, it talks about the universal judgment when even the animals and birds will be destroyed. But during the millennial kingdom, even the animals and birds will live at peace. Um, maybe we can just look at the Isaiah uh, you know, passage about that. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. Isaiah 11, 7 to 9. The cow and the veer shall graze their young. One shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the wheels child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. So here in this Isaiah passage, it's talking about the end time millennial kingdom of God after his second coming. When he will establish his throne on the earth. At that time, even the wild animals you know, which you generally tend to kill other animals, they also will live at peace with one another. And then it says, children will be able to play with cobras. And why? Because nobody will harm or destroy on my holy mountain. 
and then after this millennial kingdom we know right this one final war between satan and all of his forces and god and so at that time the entire world which we know today will be completely destroyed in a universal judgment at that time the birds and the beasts and the fish and everything in fact this entire earth will all be wiped out and then you will have a new jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth established so here in zephaniah last chapter it's talking about the day of the lord when a new heaven and a new earth will be established whereas the first chapter of zephaniah is talking about the universal judgment which will come after the millennial kingdom okay so that's basically the the time span which is uh, being discussed over here in this uh, in 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 this particular book of zephaniah um yeah i think that's about it uh, if anyone has any questions you can ask otherwise we can close with a word of prayer all right so let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you for all the things that we were able to cover today uh, from these three prophetic books lord you sent these prophets to speak these words to us so that we can learn from them all the old testament scriptures have been given for our learning for our correction for our spiritual growth so we pray oh lord that we will not just look at these as old testament stories but as um actual events from which we can learn so that we don't repeat the mistakes which they made oh lord in their time so we pray oh father that unlike this um people of juda who were stubborn in their sinfulness we will have humble repentant hearts oh lord and we pray that we will look forward eagerly to all these prophecies which you have offered us regarding the end times when you promised oh lord that you will establish justice when you promised oh lord that the righteous will be lifted up so we pray that we will not be people who will give up hope but we will continue to trust in you and we will wait on you O oh Lord, with an obedient attitude, until the time comes when we will see an answer to our prayers. Help us, O oh Lord, to have that kind of a trusting, faith-filled attitude towards you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.